Welcome everyone, good evening. Thank you for attending this information session on carbon dioxide pipelines issues for landowners and concerned citizens in Illinois. My name is Joyce Blumenshine. I'm a volunteer with the Coalition to Stop CO2 Pipelines. We are a grassroots initiated and led organization. Tonight's program is our first, so bear with us. Uh, we will be holding more programs in the future on specific topics. Our coalition was formed by concerned individuals and downstate property owners after our navigator letter was received by property owners in mid-December of last year. The coalition is uh, going to have a, a variety of speakers tonight, which I'll introduce shortly. Right now, I just want to kind of give us a grounding for those who might not be aware of the navigator issue. Please bear with me while I share my screen and I'll show you a few slides. Navigator Ventures LLC, large scale liquefied CO2 pipeline is going to be 1,300 miles of CO2 pipeline across parts are all in the case of Iowa of states in central uh, Midwest. And um, it will affect Illinois by coming in from the West in Hancock County, 13 counties in Illinois will be affected and there's 280 miles currently planned. So from that background, we know that uh, Navigator is just one of the companies coming to Illinois. This, web, this is a webinar. So I do wanna mention, it might be a little different for some of us, you won't uh, see your, yourself. We are going to feature our speakers with a highlight. Everyone can post questions in the Q&A. That's a tab at the bottom of your screen. Type in your questions. Our volunteers will read those off after the speakers in order to save time. So our order tonight will include um, keynote speakers and then we'll hear from Pam uh, Richard, who's one of our team members. Our first speaker is going to be Jessica Wiskus. She is an Iowa farmland owner who loves her land. The CO2 pipelines expansion hit Iowa before Illinois. Jessica will tell us why this all matters so much and what are her concerns for farmland impacts. Our second speaker is attorney and pipeline issues expert, Paul Blackburn. Paul began working on crude oil pipeline issues in 2008. He has worked extensively on CO2 pipelines, renewable energy policy. He's authored a variety of analysis and safety reports. Our final speaker will be Illinois attorney, John Albers. John's work has focused on energy and utility matters, including a variety of hearings and proceedings with pipelines in our state. He will explain the CO2 pipeline process that happens with the Illinois Commerce Commission. This is key for pipeline approvals and all of us in Illinois need to be aware of the process because it, Illinois citizens can participate. So thank you again for attending tonight. It is now my pleasure to turn this over to Jessica Wiskus. Thanks so much, Joyce. And thank you to everyone who is joining us tonight. A week or so before Thanksgiving, I received a certified letter from Navigator notifying me that my property was in the pipeline corridor. Well, I have to admit that at the time, I didn't really know much about carbon pipelines, how they were different from other pipelines, but I started to do some research and what I learned sent me knocking on my neighbor's doors. Of course, the map that Navigator gave me wasn't very good, but since I'm the daughter of a sixth generation Iowa farmer, it didn't take too long to figure out whose fields and farmhouses would be affected. After talking with my neighbors, I decided to organize a local meeting about the pipeline. And at that first meeting, over a hundred people attended. Well, I live in a rural community where trust, integrity, and honesty are all very high. And so my neighbors and I have stood together against this pipeline ever since that meeting. We've distributed yard signs. We've cheered each other on at public meetings. We've sent letters to the Iowa Utilities Board and we have pledged that we are not going to sign voluntary easements with Navigator. We're going to fight this thing first. And our little group has grown in numbers joining with a statewide nonprofit organization to help us fight against the abuse of eminent domain. Why are we so opposed to the carbon pipelines? Look, we know very well that individuals sometimes have to make sacrifices for the greater good. 
We know it because that's how our families have survived here for so many generations. We help each other. We stand for something greater than just ourselves as individuals. But these carbon pipeline projects are not for the greater good. For one thing, carbon pipelines are uniquely dangerous. You will hear more about this in the presentations to come, but I will just say that in Iowa at least, Navigator's route puts farmhouses, ball fields, churches, historic buildings, Native American burial mounds, and even school districts in the pipeline corridor. I know that maybe we're considered too rural for corporate executives to care about, but we live here, our families live here, and we have built our communities here. Secondly, we're opposed to the use of eminent domain for these carbon pipelines. Eminent domain takes away our land, what we love, and gives over its use to a private company for their profits. And what will this look like? As it turns out, Iowa recently experienced a kind of test case of modern pipeline construction when Dakota Access came through our state in 2016. Photos here, graciously provided by Iowa Farmer who went through it, show evidence of mixing of soils, compaction, draining of water into surrounding fields, damage to the tiling and more. This farmer was not alone in his heartbreak. Last fall, a report in Iowa Farmer Today about the Dakota Access Pipeline quoted a professor from ISU. He said, our findings show extensive soil disturbance from construction activities had adverse effects on soil physical properties, which come from mixing of topsoil and subsoil, as well as soil compaction from heavy machinery. You see, the pipeline company obeyed the letter of the law when they separated out the topsoil from the subsoil, but then they drove over the topsoil while they were building the pipeline, mixing the soils. And they worked the land under extremely wet conditions, compacting the soil. The tiling was never made right, and farmers were left with reduced fertility, problems with erosion and lowered yields. In this photo, you can see the scar two years later. All of this has direct financial consequences for rural families, of course. And that's not to mention the damage that pipeline construction does to ecological systems like restored prairies, wetlands, forest reserves, and conservation lands. If you have acres in CRP, the Federal Conservation Reserve Program, I urge you to contact your FSA officer as soon as possible to learn more about what pipeline construction would mean for your contract. Bringing to bear the power of condemnation through eminent domain would trigger a whole host of consequences for landowners. And that's why my county's Farm Bureau citing potential infringement on the private, private property rights of Iowans, submitted an objection to the Iowa Utilities Board against Navigator's proposed pipeline, stating, representing Lynn County Farm Bureau members, we are requesting the Iowa Utilities Board to deny the use of eminent domain for Navigator LLC at this time. You see, this pipeline deeply offends farm families out here. It's not just about our land, it's about the land, the land that feeds the world, the land that we all care for, the land we steward, the land fertile and rich that we want to pass to the next generation. The soil that we have here is irreplaceable. Mother Nature took a thousand years to make it, but a pipeline would undo all of that. A farmer's wealth is in the land. Everyone knows that. But what do I mean by land? Soil is a part of what land is about, no doubt. But that isn't all that I mean when I say that a farmer's wealth is in her land. Land for many of us means something more than just a line on a balance sheet. Land isn't just a possession. It isn't just dirt. It's about our heritage and it's about our hope. Land for us is about the abundance of life that is rooted in the earth and that fundamentally is not of our own making. One of my neighbors said to me, it's not like the land is a part of me. 
but like I am a part of the land. And he said it well, that's the gift bestowed on us by the land. It places us face to face with something greater, something true. And so the wealth of the land isn't about what we own. It's about to whom our lives are responsible, to corporate executives, to private investors, to powerful politicians, or to the gift of life that we are called to steward. Private corporations want to take the part of the wealth that is seen on a property deed, but they disregard what the land really means. They disregard the part that is the true gift. It's because of this that we will not sign voluntary easements with these pipeline companies. And look, it takes strength to stand up to powerful corporate and political forces, but that strength doesn't have to come from you or from me alone. I would just ask you, please, after this webinar, please go outside and consider all the strength that Mother Nature has shown you and what you might show for her in return. And know that your neighbors are considering the same thing. Think about joining together as we're doing in Iowa, however you can, standing neighbor to neighbor to protect the land. Thanks, thanks so much for listening to something that is very, very close to my own heart and I believe close to yours. So I just wanna pass this on to Paul Blackburn who will speak next about carbon pipelines, about their safety risks and about the rush to build them in the Midwest. Thanks. Hi everybody, I'm Paul Blackburn and I wanted to thank you for being here tonight. And first I'd like to show a quick video. Um, so let me share my screen. This is a video uh, prepared by a European uh, standard setting and consulting group. And it shows uh, a, uh, an a pipeline rupture that was done intentionally as an experiment to test some of the models for where the CO2 would go. And I wanted to say first, this is an eight inch pipeline it only releases the equivalent of about 4,000 meters or about three and a half miles of pipe. And the amount of, of CO2 that comes out of a pipe is generally uh, is, is set by how big and how large in diameter the pipe is and how many miles of pipe vents. So this is just eight inch and 4,000 meters. So let me play this. There we go. So you can see them. All right. So what is supercritical CO2? Well, like I said, it's this hybrid of substance. And the reason that it's important for uh, enhanced oil recovery and for carbon sequestration is that like a gas, it can move through porous substances like porous rock and can be ejected underground. But like an, uh, a liquid, it can dissolve and, and mobilize certain kinds of hydrocarbons, uh, such as oil and even plastics. Um, and one of the things that, that's unique about it is that very small changes in pressure, temperature, or contaminants in the stream flow can result in really dramatic changes in how it behaves. And just as a sense of it, it's also about as heavy as water. Um, so as I said, the reason that they want to ship it as supercritical CO2 is two reasons. First, that it's much denser than a gas, and it's more economical to ship it that way. And the second reason is because it's, it needs to be in that state for sequestration and if it's used for enhanced oil recovery for that reason. Um, and it is it the same as transferring oil and natural gas? And, and it really isn't because of this hybrid liquid gas nature, the supercritical CO2 just simply behaves differently during operations and ruptures. Um, the high pressure and, uh, and varying temperature and periods make it quite difficult to predict how it's gonna react in different circumstances. And this unusual, this unusual properties create a number of safety issues. Um, and unfortunately, almost all the CO2 pipeline safety research appears to be doing, be, being done in Europe. I mean, the, the fundamental reason is that uh, like um, oil and petroleum products are liquids and they stay liquids and natural gas is a gas and it stays gas. Supercritical CO2 is a funny hybrid, and, and if, if it's not controlled carefully, it can switch back and forth between gas, liquid, and, and a supercritical state, and that can be quite dangerous. 
Uh, also, supercritical CO2 can be very corrosive. If even microscopic amounts of water are mixed in with the CO2 stream, it can rapidly corrode the high carbon steel pipes that it's through which it will flow. And the companies know that, but the question is, will they be able to keep the water out of it uh, reliably over time? And also other contaminants can work synergistically. They can be corrosive too, but they can also work synergistically together to accelerate corrosion. And that's not particularly well understood. And then, um, like I said, because it can dissolve hydrocarbons, it can also dissolve seals, coatings, lubricants, and other non-metallic materials, um, you know, which might work fine in oil and gas pipelines, but not everything that works in them is gonna work in a supercritical CO2 pipeline. Um, so what about the pressure impacts? Well, if there's a rapid drop in pressure, it can significantly damage pipelines. First off, they're what are called running ductile fractures, which don't typically happen in natural gas and never happen in, in, in oil pipelines. And we'll talk about that in a second. And small changes in amounts and types of contaminants in the stream can change the way it behaves significantly and have a dramatic impacts on safety. And in addition, um, changes in shipment amounts, for example, during cyclical cycles, um, market cycles, or seasonal variations in CO2 production can change the way operations and safety, uh, and operations and safety of a pipeline. Um, when a supercritical CO2 pipeline ruptures, it, it for, the CO2 rushes out, and most of it converts to a gas, but some of it, because of the rupture and the depressurization, forms dry ice, which forms at minus 190 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, that dry ice can have a significant impact um, on uh, pipeline operations. It can jam up valves. I've looked at all the CO2 ruptures in the last decade, and many of them relate to uh, dry ice formation in a pipe uh, as it's depressurizing that interferes with its operations. Um, super cold temperatures can also simply make the steel pipe quite brittle. And it's also possible for the steel to contract quickly enough that it can detach internal and external coatings of the pipe. Um, and there are significant risks of humans to animals once the supercritical CO2 comes out, of the, comes out of a pipe. And these include asphyxiation. It's, if, if there's enough, there's too little oxygen in the area, it can suffocate people. Um, and it can also intoxicate people. And you can see some of the lists there of um, typical uh, symptoms of CO2 poisoning. And with high enough levels, it becomes quite dangerous. Um, but even at lower levels, it can, it can cause, uh, 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 it can cause uh, intoxication. And certainly people are using heavy equipment or outside in the wintertime or driving vehicles or whatever. I mean, intoxication can be quite dangerous as well. And what we really need to do here in part is, to, we'll talk about this more, but is, is to start determining the danger zone for these pipelines. And again, the danger zone depends on the diameter of the pipeline and how much CO2 would come out. And there are certainly models that can do that. We'll talk about that in a second. Probably the best known CO2 uh, pipeline rupture was a 24 inch pipeline that ruptured in Satarshi, Mississippi in February 22nd, 2020 that about 9.5 miles of pipe released 9,532 barrels, uh, the company estimated. 49 people were hospitalized and over 250 evacuated. Satarshi is a very small town. That's most everybody was in the town. Um, and the first responders were put at risk. Satarshi was almost exactly one, the center of Satarshi is almost exactly one mile from the pipeline rupture. Um, and when the first responders got there, they uh, became intox started become intoxicated themselves, and even their vehicles had stopped functioning. Uh, three men who were caught in it, three of the citizens there who were caught in it in their car, the car stalled because there wasn't enough oxygen in the in the area to, to operate for the car to run. So there's one of these ruptures, and enough CO2 comes out, it can be quite difficult for first responders and emergency personnel to get in. It can be quite difficult for victims to try to get themselves out because they could be intoxicated and not know what's happening. Uh, they are described as walking around like zombies in Satarsha, um, and their vehicles may not work. Um, here are some symptoms uh, from the USDA. You can see at 4%, uh, 40,000 parts per million, it's considered immediately dangerous to life or health. It's the standard carbon term. At 5%, you can see that it starts creating confusion and headaches and shortness of breath. And at 8%, there's even more significant impacts. And it's also possible for the for people to become unconscious and, 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 and pass away. In Satarsha, some people did pass out from the, from the gas. So what's a running ductile fracture? Well, when the CO2 ruptures out of a pipeline, 
the critical supercritical CO2 starts turning into a gas, and this gas um, expands, and, it, and the pressure of the expansion can actually rip the pipe open. So you know when the CO2 comes out, it turns starts converting to gas outside of the pipe, but then the conversion starts happening inside the pipe. And as it rips the pipe open, more of the pipe gets, the CO2 gets converted inside the pipe along, further in, further along the pipeline route. And this can just simply unzip a pipeline. It, and this can be stopped with stronger steel or crack arresters. But the question for stronger steel is how strong, and the question for crack arresters is how closely are they, are they sighted. And what the Europeans are finding is the existing engineering models that are used for natural gas and oil pipelines are simply not adequate. Um, here's a picture of a test rupture that was done in Italy. You can see that the right hand side there, there are a couple of people in that red circle to give you a sense of scale. That's a 24 inch diameter pipe. It was a 50 meter test rig and um, that pipe just ripped open for essentially you know, 50 meters um, and blew that trench in the ground when it did it. So that's the kind of uh, violence, even though these pipelines don't explode in the sense of burning, there's still a tremendous amount of pressure um, and force inside these pipelines that can be released and, and do a great deal of damage. This on the left hand side is a, a, a picture of the crack rester um, where it stopped. It's, it looks like it's probably fiberglass wrapped around the pipe, it could also be steel. And on the right hand side, it shows what happens if, it's, um, uh, if the steel is just strong enough to stop it. And again, this is relatively complex engineering, and they're doing these tests to try to verify the models. And their conclusion from this test was the models simply aren't good enough to determine how strong these pipes need to be. So, what about dispersion modeling? Well, that means that it's a computer model that figures out where the how far the CO2 is going to go from the rupture to the level where it's dangerous. And citizens first responders, you know, have a right to know if they're in the danger zone or not. And there are many models that can be used, including sophisticated, um, what are called computational fluid dynamic models that can take kind of weather and, and topography and buildings and structures, and, you know, to determine how far away people are at risk um, if there's a rupture in the pipeline near them. But as far as I know, the regulators and the industry have not defined what these danger zones are. We know what they are for natural gas pipelines, just formulas to do that, and that, that can be calculated. But for the CO2 pipelines, it hasn't been done. We are contracting with a modeling group right now to do some initial uh, studies of the uh, danger zone of these pipelines, and we're looking forward to sharing those at some point. Um, in terms of regulation, there really is no centralized regulation of these. The federal government regulates pipeline safety, which means pipeline design, construction, operation, and maintenance, and, and it also regulates certain water crossings. The states generally have the right to regulate route and overall project approval. Not all do, but Illinois does. Uh, emergency planning response is not centrally regulated. The federal government doesn't regulate, doesn't federalize uh, police and fire uh, department response, emergency response. It's up to the counties and the state to work out the emergency response plan for these pipeline for their crews to respond to a pipeline rupture and for citizens. Um, in some states, there can be county zoning, but that depends on state preemption law. And there's no federal regulation of the commercial aspect of these pipelines. Natural gas and oil pipelines are regulated by the, by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. It determines their profit margins. Um, but for CO2 pipelines, there's no commercial regulation. Um, so again, federal pipeline safety law, the people tend to overstate what this does and doesn't do. It regulates pipeline operators with regard to the design, construction, and operation and maintenance of pipelines, but not the route. And it doesn't regulate everything that's conceivable could conceivably be called safety. It regulates just these specific issues with regard to what the pipeline operator is going to do. So a state can't come in and say put in stronger steel walls, but it can certainly regulate its own police and fire departments in terms of emergency response. Uh, the Pipeline Safety uh, Act, unfortunately, does not require any permits. The way it's set up, it's the industry essentially self-regulating. And because there's no permits required, then there's no public participation requirements under federal law. So there's no way for citizens to participate in anything at the pipeline, uh, any Pipeline Safety Act regulation. Um, so, and in terms of, you know, how the regulatory structure evolved at the federal level, uh, originally uh, the Pipeline Safety Act applied to gas pipelines, and then they added oil pipelines and did a whole set of regulations specifically for oil pipelines. 
And then a decade or so later, uh, Congress decided that it should cover CO2 pipelines. But rather than doing a specific set of regulations specifically for CO2 pipelines, they decided, because there weren't that many of them, that they would just apply the oil pipeline uh, regulations, lock, stock, and barrel to CO2 pipelines, even though it's a very different substance with different behaviors. So it's kind of tacked on to, the, to federal law. And again, federal law, I'm going to emphasize this, does not prohibit local emergency response planning. In fact, it, it, if you look at the law, it encourages it. Um, John is going to talk about state Illinois state permits and regulations, so I'm not going to get into this, but there is regulation of these uh, pipelines in, in Illinois. And, and why is there so all of a sudden these, this rush to build them? I mean, there's three different proposals, um, Summit Navigator and, and a um, Wolf Pipeline proposal, and there could be more. Um, and the reason is because the federal government has set up a tax credit that's so generous that it's created a gold rush. The tax credit uh, is, is given to the entity that captures and sequesters the CO2, either as uh, just pure sequestration or enhanced oil recovery. Uh, for pure sequestration, the tax credit is $50, $50 per metric ton, and it lasts for 12 years. And it is understood at the time that this law was passed that ethanol plants, uh, to make it profitable, need between $25 and $35 per metric ton. So the federal government is providing a, a heck of a profit margin for them. And just because the federal you know, government thinks this is a good idea doesn't mean that the technology is ready or the commercial aspects of this have been worked out or that it's really good for the environment. Um, so that's that's what's going on. And, and I think one of the most important things about these pipelines is that the scale here is really remarkably different than what's come in the past. The industry talks about how they've had a lot of experience with their 5,000 miles of existing pipelines. A lot of those pipe, most of those pipelines, or I think all of them are from one geologic CO2 source to oil fields for enhanced oil recovery. There are a few that there's one that does sequestration, I believe, but it's short. Um, and so these are relatively pipelines, simple pipeline systems. The Summit Navigator projects in Iowa are much larger scale and involve many sources and likely many sequestration wells. And this larger scale will likely cause a variety of technical challenges and new safety risks and require new regulations. Um, and, and it's really important to understand this could just be the first wave of pipelines that come through. These are the Summit Navigator maps. Um, doesn't go all the way into Illinois, or maybe because it does, it maybe not show all of the Illinois pipe route proposed. Um, but you know, you can see that they're overlapping their territories and they're pi building pipes all over the place. And just think of the farmers who could be at all those intersections and how many pipes are going to go through the properties. But this could just be the first wave. The tax credits could become increasingly generous, and we could see this doesn't cover all the ethanol facilities in these states. There are many more, and plus there are more fertilizer facilities, cement plants, power plants, and other places. And if you start putting all these CO2 sources on the map and then think about where are the pipelines that go between them all, it could become real massive spaghetti. Um, and so this could just be the first wave that could be hitting you and your, your land. This is another map that was done by a study out of Princeton University. And this map shows this very logical approach of trunk lines with feeders going into it, but that's not how this is gonna work. The way that's being set up is that the pipeline companies uh, get certain customers, connect them to those particular facilities. So it's this is looking at this, it's setting 21,000 kilometers, with, you know, what, um, 10,000 miles of trunk lines and 40 something thousand miles of, spur lines, but that's assuming a rational planned approach. But we're going to be seeing potentially overlapping systems that are redundant and and not coordinated at all. So it could be many more miles if the industry gets exactly what it wants looking into the future. So it's really important for folks to understand this is just the, potentially just the first wave and whatever you learn now will be very useful in the future. But thank you for your attention and um, happy to answer any questions and I will stop my screen share and um and we'll look forward to answering some questions for you thank you okay john if you're ready we'll move to you before we do questions oh forgot to unmute myself all right do you see my screen yes looks good all right, thank you. It's always tough to follow Paul. I had the pleasure of working with him a couple of years ago and he is very knowledgeable. Um, 
going to run through with you uh, how the Illinois Commerce Commission handles pipelines. But uh, first, before I get into that, I should probably describe what the Illinois Commerce Commission uh, is or does. Um, the ICC is an independent executive branch state agency that uh, regulates the electric, natural gas, water, and wastewater public utilities in Illinois, and also common carriers by pipeline, uh, like the kind of pipeline we're talking about here. <clears throat> It still has some authority over telecommunications carriers, but those are largely unregulated, and it does have uh, some additional authority over transportation, like, um, for example, uh, movers and uh, tow trucks in the Chicago area, and also rail crossings throughout the state. But uh, most people do not know what the Illinois Commerce Commission does, but it really does affect, as you can see, just about every person in the state. Um, its mission is to balance the interest of consumers with the utility and to do this, it employs uh, experts in a variety of fields, such as accountants and engineers, attorneys and financial analysts. And uh, they test the industry's proposals as well as any proposal by uh, other parties in a case. Um, at least that's how it's supposed to work. Uh, ALJs, or I'm sorry, administrative law judges are attorneys employed by the commission who have, fill the role of judges and uh, they hear and consider the arguments and then make recommendations to the five commissioners who are appointed by the governor and they're the ones that make the ultimate final decision in the case. Um, as as Paul, one of Paul's slides noted, uh, Illinois does have a statute on this topic and it's the Carbon Dioxide Transportation and Sequestration Act. Uh, that was adopted in 2011. Um, there was a particular project in mind when, when the legislature passed that law. Uh, it did not come to fruition. Um, what, what this statute provides for is the ICC application process for a certificate of authority uh, to construct and operate a pipeline to transport and sequester CO2. Now the statute itself declares CO2 pipelines to be a public use and service, to be in the public interest, and to be a benefit to the welfare of Illinois. Now, again, at the time, it was geared towards the continued use of Illinois coal, but the language of the statute is applicable to any effort that will reduce CO2 emissions from a particular source or sources. Uh, the statute provides that the ICC may grant a certificate if it makes specific written findings. And my wife's always accusing me of lawyering things up, but I do just want to give you an example, or at least a, provide the list of the things that the statute provides for the commission to consider. Uh, you know, one, whether the application is properly filed, uh, whether the applicant is fit, willing, and able, uh, whether the applicant has an agreement with the source of CO2 emissions, and like in the case of the Navigator pipeline, that would be agreements with the ethanol plants that I understand it intends to uh, transport CO2 from. Uh, whether the applicant has filed all of the uh, FEMSA forms, and FEMSA stands for the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration. That is a federal agency. It's part of the U.S. Department of Transportation. Um, they're the ones that uh, you know implement uh, some of the Pipeline Safety Act provisions that Paul referenced. Um, the statute also specifies that the applicant you know, should demonstrate that they've applied for all necessary permits from the US Army Corps of Engineers. Um, and the applicant has an, what, what in shorthand is called an AMA with the Illinois Department of Ag. Um, an AMA, AMA stands for Agricultural Impact Mitigation Agreement. State law requires uh, these types of agreements uh, with between developers and the Department of Ag for a variety of you know large projects that are done in Illinois. Uh, pipelines are just one type of project. They also require them for wind farms, uh, solar farms, and basically the AMA sets forth the terms by which the uh, project company will uh, handle the land, you know, primarily the far the farmland. Um, it, it, it covers a lot of different issues, um, and appropriately so. Uh, like for example, um, some of the issues that are covered include, um, some of the issues that are covered include the treatment of drain tiles, uh, and the, the correction of any, any tiles that are broken, um, 
wet weather uh, work uh, prohibits specifically um, working when the when the ground is so wet that it would mix the topsoil with the subsoil. Uh, the Department of Ag recognizes that's not a good thing and tries to keep you know the companies from doing that. In the absence of it, I've seen companies try to you know talk a farmer into letting them you know work any time of the year. Um, but basically, uh, is they're trying to protect the land as much as the Department of Ag re deems reasonably necessary or appropriate. Um, the applicant also must have the necessary financial, managerial, legal, and technical qualifications. In other words, they know what they're doing and can pay for it. Um, and they also, the statute also requires the uh, pipeline company to, I'm sorry, it requires the commission uh, to consider other specific points. Um, and that includes the evidence of, I'm sorry, evidence of the effect on the economy, infrastructure, and public safety, uh, on property values. But I'll note that evidence of the effect on property values, but I'll note that the commission will not um, assess any change in property value. That, that would be, be done by, in a, by a circuit court in a condemnation proceeding if it came to that. Um, also, uh, evidence from the from DCEO that stands for the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. That is the state agency that uh, one of its responsibilities is to try to ensure economic development in the state. Uh, so you can see why they would want DCEO to be involved. Um, as a practical matter, you know, DCEO um, they're allowed to get involved in a variety of different proceedings, and rarely do. Um, and further on in the statute, it says that, uh, you know, any party can raise the same type of evidence that are called for in the uh, earlier provisions. For example, it doesn't have to be DCEO that would argue about there present evidence on uh, economic development. Um, and then any other state, state or federal, federal entity can get involved and provide information on uh, security, stability, and reliability of energy. The pipeline company also, uh, under the statute, they have to propose either a preferred route or a preferred route width. And that width can be a corridor up to 200 feet wide. And the rationale in the statute is that once they get going with the project, they may realize that they can't put the pipeline exactly here, but they could put it maybe 100 feet over that way. And that would avoid some obstacle that they weren't aware of or hadn't considered thoroughly uh, in their planning stage. Um, the statute also provides 11-month deadline. Uh, that's a pretty tight deadline on particularly large projects like this. Um, the statute also says the construction must be conditioned on the company obtaining all of the uh, PIMSA, Corps of Engineers, Department of Ag, and other permits and approvals. So you have to make sure that they have they have to have all that before they can start construction. Um, now they can still engage in their planning, uh, easement acquisition efforts, including eminent domain, uh, before they start before they have all the permits. But they have to get all that before they actually put a shovel in the ground. Um, now the probably the most concerning part about this statute is that if a certificate is granted by the commission, the company automatically receives eminent domain authority to condemn an easement. Uh, now, before, condemn, before condemning an easement, they must use reasonable and good faith efforts to acquire the land interest by, nego land interest by negotiation. But, you know, again, then it says it's up to the company, though, to decide when to exercise eminent domain authority. And they can decide to do that if it becomes uh, necessary to avoid unreasonable delay or economic hardship for the project. Now, I've had some ask me, is this constitutional? And I think it's a very good question. I don't know. Um, I, I'm not a con uh, eminent domain expert. Um, I can't tell you that under the Illinois Eminent Domain Act, you know, there are certain projects that the General Assembly uh, provides what's called for uh, as quit quick take condemnation authority. Those projects, um, when they're in the statute, are very specific as to what the project is. Whereas in this statute, it's just general and applies statewide. 
So that, that could be an issue there. Um, we don't know for sure because the statute's never been, been challenged in court. Um, it, it's only been used to the point of it actually having a certificate granted, I believe just once. And that was the project I alluded to earlier that never came to fruition. Um, so again, you know, there's no case law on, what, on, on any aspect of this statute. But I think the constitutionality of an eminent domain provision is a, a legitimate, you know, reasonable question to, to consider. Now, if the pipeline operator does get to the point where they're going to be seeking as easements, uh, there's an administrative code part in the Illinois rules. And that's 83 Illinois Administrative Code Part 302. Uh, that provides the rules that govern the pipeline company's efforts to acquire an easement. And I, I mentioned this because there are two provisions that I think are particularly relevant to landowners here. Um, the first one is in that section 30230A that, I'm, that I have a quote from. Um, prior to an owner or operator contacting a landowner to negotiate an easement, it has to file its application at the ICC. Um, I have heard rumors, and I don't know if this is true or not, but I've heard rumors uh, from various sources that Navigator may have already tried to uh, contact landowners to acquire an easement. Um, now, they, they, they can send you an invitation to an open house saying that later we're gonna ask you for an easement. That's arguably okay. But if they have specifically contacted a landowner uh, to negotiate an easement, that is not okay. And I would encourage anyone that has been approached to uh, contact the organizers of this webinar. Um, now, when they, after they've sent out their, after they file their application, they then can reach out to, to landowners, but they have to send a certified letter to each landowner at least two weeks before they telephone you or knock on your door. Uh, again, that is in the rule and it must be complied with. Um, if, if it turns out that uh, Navigator or any other pipeline company is not following this rule, uh, it is possible to file a complaint at the ICC uh, pointing this out. Um, the state law provides for certain financial penalties if a company does not comply with commission rules. Now, whether the commission would actually impose a financial penalty is hard to say. Um, the thing to remember, though, is that clearly, you know, it's, it's hard to argue that they, if, if they have, in fact, sent you something, you know, before filing, a, filing their application, it's hard to deny that that happened if you have, have evidence in your hand. I would like to think the commission would uh, specifically then, you know, direct a company to comply with the rule and cease further contact until it's filed an application. Um, but, you know, one thing to consider here is that, you know, if that happened, it would also, you know, start things off on the wrong, wrong step for the company. And I would encourage you to, you know, let the media know about that, um, you know, advertise it because it is, it is an important, you know, sign and how the company does conducts itself and you know does business whether it's going to follow the most basic rules or not um when you are contacted or if you are contacted about an easement from the landowner i would you know do not agree to or sign anything and, and i listed that twice because it's very important to you know to follow that um you know i have seen plenty of first draft you know easements from utilities and, and they are, you know, drafted with, with their interests in mind. Um, they are not looking out for your interests necessarily. You know, some are better than others, but definitely don't just agree to whatever they offer. And I'm not talking about dollar amounts. I'm talking about how they'll treat the land as well. Um, so the other question that comes up is, you know, I've been contacted by them to just walk on my land and, and do a survey. Uh, you, there's no no need to grant them that access to your property. Uh, you don't have to do that. That's solely up to you. They can't make you um, let you come onto their property for a survey. Uh, I would definitely recommend that you have an experienced attorney um, look at whatever documents that a pipeline company wants you to sign. Um, you know, there there are several out there that you know, do have you know experience with with easements, but I would specifically try to find someone who has experience with utility and pipeline easements. Um, I'm going to recommend you know a colleague of mine. I, I recently left uh, the law firm of Westerbelt, Johnson, Nicole, and Keller, uh, just for a different career opportunity. I had nothing against them. I think very highly of them, 
But my colleague there, Bill Shea, has has a ton of experience with 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 these types of easements. Um, so I put his name and contact information there. Um, if anyone is interested in just talking to him about about an easement they're approached with. Um, also, as far as easements, well, wait, well, well, one more thought on easements. Um, I mentioned that it's important to consider more than just dollar amounts. I mean, you know, something to th think about um, with regard to easements. This is not a conclusive list. There, this is just examples. Um, the agricultural impact and aggregation agreement I referenced earlier, um, you know, including certain provisions you might find in that in your easement would also give you the ability to enforce the terms, at least those specific provisions. Because I would note that the uh, EMA with the Department of Ag is an agreement between the, the, the pipeline company and the Department of Ag. It would be the Department of Ag that would enforce it, not you as the landowner. So if you want to have the ability to enforce some of those provisions, it would be, I, I would consider including them uh, in, in your own easement agreement with the company. And for that matter, you can go above and beyond the provisions that are in the AMA agreement. You know, if you want a more stricter standard, you can propose that as a counter offer to, to the company. Um, I would even consider including repercussions in the easement agreement that would you know be against the company if they somehow violated certain terms you know what what right do you have what what penalty do they have to you know comply with um I, i've seen agreements that people negotiated themselves with the utility company and then after the fact the utility violated it and then the landowner contacts me for help and the utility says look we complied with the easement and they can't prove any damages so too bad um so i would definitely you know consider that uh, decommissioning would be something else to consider in, in the easement. You know, if at some point the pipeline is no longer used, do you want to let you want it left in your land? Um, you you, sh you could consider, you know, proposing that they require the. You should you could consider proposing that they remove the pipeline upon um, abandonment, and you could even consider including language about the purpose of it. You know, is it going to is it supposed to be used or limited to the use for? sequestration for, you know, permanent sequestration, I should say, or um, could this ever be used to, um, you know, for transporting CO2 outside of the sequestration area for something like enhanced oil recovery? You know, these are just ideas of things you could propose uh, to the pipeline company in an easement agreement, whether the, you know, whether, whether you would ever actually come to an agreement on including all those terms is a different matter, but, um, you know, just things to consider. Uh, and finally, with regard to the you know easements, I would definitely recommend working together. It's going to be much easier for a pipeline company to pick off, so to speak, you know, landowners one by one, and 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 force. I don't want to use the word force in terms of uh, you know, in a, in a well, it, it'll be much easier for them to pick off landowners one by one than it would be to. Uh, you know, force easements out of out of a large group are all looking for the same terms. You, you know, there's strength in numbers. I'll put it that way. Um, I would also suggest working with your communities, uh, which I think is you know part of the point of this webinar. Um, you know, find out what if any local zoning requirements there are. Uh, some counties in Illinois have no zoning ordinances at all. So this could be a good opportunity to, you know, educate your local officials about the projects and the risks. Um, you know, may, perhaps a county would want to consider making requiring a special use permit for a, for a CO2 pipeline. Uh, maybe they'd want to consider imposing setback requirements from residences or other sensitive areas like schools. Um, you know, setback requirements are pretty common. I mean, they're, they're required for wind, wind turbines. Um, if, if they're required for something like a wind turbine, then perhaps they should be required for something that could you know, kill you in your sleep if there is a leak. Um, and again, uh, use this as an opportunity to educate, educate your local first responders and health professionals. Um, you know, I doubt, just like the like the first responders in Satarsia learned, that they they've got much experience with CO two re releases. You know, will they know how to re react if 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 there is a release? Uh, you know, not just you know, for, for the safety of themselves as well as, as, as the, uh, you know, people in the way. Um, if any counties or municipalities like that, you know, impose any types of, um, you know, moratoria or, or pass resolutions regarding 
the pipelines. Uh, that is definitely, you know, a, a good step, but it won't matter though, if they don't let the ICC know, which, you know, is my segue into how the ICC operates. Um, first, generally, you know, the ICC's proceedings are what they call quasi-judicial. Um, you know, basically, I, I was an administrative law judge with the Commerce Commission for several years, and basically, you know, picture a, a trial court without the robes. Um, we hear evidence, judges hear the evidence from both parties, or from all the parties, um, and then weigh it. And the, the evidence comes in the forms, form of written testimony and exhibits. And then we have a hearing where there's cross-examination of witnesses. Um, then, they, then they file legal briefs that are, you know, contain all the legal arguments where they apply the facts to the law. Uh, it's, it's, you know, in, it's a very long process. I, I, I don't want to sugarcoat it. It, it, it can be painful. Um, I know some folks on this call, you know, are aware of that from firsthand experience and, and, and engaging in other matters at the ICC. But, you know, it is a process that you want to have, you know, expert representation in. You know, earlier I mentioned that, you know, if you get your communities involved, you know, county governments or municipalities, um, if they intervene to present their position, uh, you know, I, I've seen in the past when I was a judge that you have sometimes local local attorneys intervene, but and no, no offense to them, but they just don't know what the process is. So I would recommend that, you know, even your local, local, uh, attorneys for your villages and villages and counties, you know, find an attorney that is well versed with ICC processes. If they do want to intervene, you know, intervening is pretty simple. Um, but again, I recommend that you intervene as a group. Uh, it, you, there's, again, strength in numbers, and it's a practical matter, you, you'll spread the cost. Anybody who intervenes that wants to make a difference, I would recommend having, you know, experts to testify. Um, the company will surely have its experts to, you know, offer its its opinions on various issues, and anybody who has concerns about the project should have their experts as well. I indicated earlier the ICC does have experts in many fields, um, but that is not, you know, all encompassing. Um, they do have some some limited experience with natural gas and oil pipelines, but to my knowledge, there is no one there that has any knowledge of CO2 pipelines, and it's as Paul indicated, they are a different creature. Um, in, in just, you know, recent experience with, with uh, you know, pipeline matter at the ICC that I was engaged in, um, you know, the, the staff had one witness who opined on the uh, appropriateness of this pipeline project. And that one witness admitted he had no experience with the issues that were raised in the case, but still thought that project was a good idea. So, if you're not going to, if, if, if staff is not going to have the expertise to evaluate these pipeline projects, um, I would sure recommend that you have it. Uh, that would involve hiring engineers to evaluate the uh, different aspects of it and health professionals. And as I noted there, my misspelled uh, name of Satarshia, uh, you might even consider trying to find a first responder from Satarshia. They might be able to give a, uh, you know, firsthand account, you know, on the record in the case as to what happened. Um, there, how it was dealt with, you know, what, how, how scary it was when people had no idea what was going on. So, uh, um, again, you know, it's, it would be expensive, but it may very well, you know, make a big difference. And if you don't have experts, um, you can pretty much be sure the outcome will be. Um, and if you do pull together, um, again, we spreading your cost. Uh, local governments would also be helpful if they were wanted to be actual interveners, like I indicated earlier. And, you know, don't forget the value of the media. Um, while the ICC does time and again, you know, pass rate increases, uh, despite the impact on consumers and the bad press, um, you know, I'm sure they don't like it. So, the bad press that is. So, I would, you know, don't, don't underestimate the value of a, you know, good media campaign. And, you know, possible goals, you know, once you, if you do get involved with the ICC, um, I would encourage you to do so because it is your right to do so as, as citizens. And you are, you would definitely be affected by this if it's, you know, on your property or, or near your property. Um, you know, I, I did not include on this list, 
um, you know, outright opposition to the project. Um, you know, I should have included that on there. I did, I did not mean to suggest that there's no way the project could be stopped. Um, I was just thinking in terms of, of uh, you know, conditions that can be imposed if the commission does decide to approve it. Um, certainly, if, the, if you see holes in their arguments that, that would impair their, uh, you know, fitness and ability or they, you know, their financial model is, is flawed, definitely, you know, I recommend that your experts bring that up. Um, but if the commission does decide they want to um, approve it, I would have as their plan B on the record um, conditions for any approval. And, and I do want to step back there to my last slide, though. I wanna, if, you, if you do have uh, government interveners, as indicated earlier, if they do want to um, you know, pass resolutions, that's all well and good, but they need to actually get in the case and get it on the ICC record. You know, make it part of the testimony and the exhibits in the case. If it's not in the testimony and the exhibits, it's not part of the record. And the commission is bound by law to base its decision on the record. So the record, again, is just the testimony, the exhibits, the cross-examination at the hearing, the legal briefs that are filed. Um, somebody just, somebody just, you know, pointing out, um, you know, sending a letter in to the commission saying, here's a copy of our resolution. That doesn't amount to a hill of beans. I, I'm sorry, but this is the way it is. But again, getting back to the possible conditions, um, you know, as I indicated earlier, setbacks from residences and other sensitive uses. Um, the commission has on other pipeline projects uh, imposed monitoring and alarm systems. Um, again, given the unique nature of CO2 pipelines, I would suggest that you, you propose conditions that would involve, you know, training first responders and health professionals. You know, put that obligation on the, on the pipeline company, not, not on your local government. Um, in many cases, I suspect a lot of these, uh, these uh, fire departments probably volunteer forces. Uh, I know they are in my town. So they don't have the budget to go out and, you know, acquire the training and for that matter, acquire the appropriate equipment they would need, um, you know, such as, you know, oxygen tanks and masks that would allow them to venture into these areas. So um, surely they have some, you know, for, you know, entering, entering a burning building, but I'm not sure that's gonna, you know, be the same for all of the, for the same type of problem you're going to have with the CO2 pipeline. So it's worth looking into and to consider what type of equipment first responders might need and then, you know, pitch that to the ICC as a possible condition on, on any approval of such a pipeline. So I think with that, I may have run over my time, but I will uh, stop my screen share here and turn back over to, to our next person, that would be Pam. <laughs> that would be... That would be Pam. Hi, everybody. Uh, I am uh, Pam Richard, and I, I too am a member of the Coalition to Stop COT CO2 Pipelines. Uh, I want to spend just a few minutes with you before we go into our Q&A. Uh, one thing I want to do is, first of all, thank all our presenters, and thank you, John. You were really, really thorough. Uh, and I want to pick up from one of the things that John said. And that is that Navigator is not supposed to be approaching landowners before they have filed their application. We've heard with the ICC, we've heard that's happening. And if, if they are doing it, they could potentially be fined uh, $30,000 for each and every offense. So I'm putting into the chat, which we have just opened, a link to a form that we are asking uh, landowners to fill out, if you would, right now, uh, that, that is going to ask if you've been approached. Uh, and if you say to me, even though you can't say that to me directly, well, that hasn't happened to me, I'm not going to fill out the form. There's a second purpose for that form. And that is, uh, there's a question there that asks if you are interested in engaging with others, as John has described, to share costs for legal representation. So, so that would be useful to us as we organize in various ways and link you to, to appropriate personnel. So if you could do that now, that would be great. If you're not a Google user, and I know a lot of folks are not, uh, we'll send it out again with the promised uh, question and answers uh, to uh, to the, the, the answers to the questions that have been raised at tonight's webinar. And, uh, and then we also will be uh, moving 
uh, along with that, we'll send send the, the questionnaire again in a different format. That's what I'm trying to say. So, Pam, yes. excuse me for interrupting, but we don't see the link yet. You don't. You don't see the link in the chat. I have put it in the chat and I have made it available to everyone. I'm going to do it again. Okay. Uh, do you see it now? No? Not yet. No, 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 no. It's my fault. It's my fault. I'm sending it to John only. Let's try that again. John doesn't need it. Although John, you can go out. <laughs> try that. Yes? Thank you. Yes, oh, perfect. Right. All right, so thank you. And it really would be helpful to us uh, if you could all fill it out tonight. So thank you for that, Sally. So before we begin with the q and A, I I'd just like to put into context where we are as a, a coalition where we've had, we're headed. So we are in the initial phases of this work and we've been at it for less than two months. And as you uh, have heard, this webinar has provided a wealth of information uh, that, that can serve as an overview of the project, its impacts, and what you need to know about the approval process. Some of that's been covered really in more detail than I expected. But I want you to know that the coalition also plans to help organize landowners, to help organize the municipal officials, county board members, township supervisors, and the emergency responders to do what we can to form the groups that John has talked about so that we can in fact be prepared to intervene uh, with the ICC. And we do have the tools at our disposal to do that. And we we'll wanna follow the, the, the uh, 20, 2011 uh, Carbon Dioxide Sequestration Act uh, for both process, but also for some of the things they're going to be looking at when deciding uh, at whether or not to approve this project. So we're gonna be talking to uh, local officials about zoning and, and updates to codes. We're gonna be talking more about impacts to farmland. We're gonna talk with the emergency responders and we're gonna be doing that in formats that are Zoom formats, but two way, not a webinar like this one. So, uh, so watch for that. The other thing I wanted to do before going into Q&A and, and some of this is coming out in the, in the, uh, in the questions that I've seen so far. Uh, there are two other points of intervention. We've talked and focused tonight solely on the ICC with little reference to those other, other, uh, other places. But what I also want to say is uh, when Navigator does file its application with the Illinois Commerce Commission, they also have to file one with the US Army Corps of Engineers. And that process we believe is going to trigger an environmental assessment and core permitting. Now it's likely without intervention and all of us here, I hope are going to be willing to be part of, 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 of doing what we can to, to, uh, to make sure that we don't have that perfunctory review that could be done by the, by the, the, the feds uh, and they could end it with a finding of no significance. It's our intent to make sure that doesn't happen. And we're going to be pushing for more comprehensive review that potentially can uh, move into the preparation of an EIS, an environmental impact statement. So, uh, so I would like to make sure that everybody knows we're not there yet, but that's another step uh, that we'll be talking about after, after the navigator has filed uh, its application with the ICC. And similarly, um, there's another process another approval process, again, touched on briefly tonight. Uh, we, the uh, company will have to file, uh, will have to obtain permit approvals rather from the US EPA for its sequestration well that will store CO2 or to be able to use that CO2 that is captured for enhanced oil recovery. So you should know that we're trying to be on top of that process as well. And again, we're gonna be reaching out to you to help engage in, in and do what we can to ask the right of questions and to, and to do whatever we can to, to make sure that, that it's not an easy thing for them to get. So we'll, you'll, you'll receive a lot more information about this if you sign up with us and move forward. And we'll make sure that when we send information to you after this webinar, you know exactly how to do that because it will be in writing. You can click a link and boom, you're signed up. So now I'd like to take the opportunity to hear from our guests. And as Joyce noted at the very beginning of the program here, we uh, did in fact uh, 
have a format ready for you tonight that puts your questions in the Q&A versus the chat. And I see them coming in the chat because I didn't close it back up again after putting that link in. We want them to use the Q&A because we wanna make sure we capture every single one. And you'll find, as you see on the screen, that little square shows you where to go. But we recognize that some of you might in fact be having trouble with that. And if you are, we have a plan. Uh, so if you are having trouble and find that you can't on your device locate that Q&A button, please do call Sally. Uh, you can contact her by text or phone and her number is listed in the screen, 618-779-5378. And uh, if you don't get her right away, that's because she in fact is taking care of other people who have the same question. So again, 618-779-5378. So with that, Lan, let's bring the presenters in and we'll begin the Q&A. Are we ready to go ahead and start with our questions? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and start with the question that was put in the chat. And then if everybody will move over to Q&A, that will be terrific. And we do have a lot of really great questions. Kathleen asks, do counties have the authority to set zoning requirements for the pipeline, such as setback from residences? Not sure who wants to take that one. John, would you like to take that one? Yeah, it's fine. I was just technical difficulties. <laughs> anyway, um, yes, it, it depends. Largely, yes, counties have authority to uh, impose zoning requirements, you know, within their territory. Um, the, the wrinkle here is that if they try to impose safety requirements on the pipeline, that gets into the federal preemption issue that Paul raised earlier. Uh, I'm talking about the Pipeline Safety Act. Uh, setback requirements um, can be can certainly be done um, if they're not, you know, attempting to regulate safety per se. Um, as indicated, you know, there are setback requirements commonly put in place for wind turbines. Um, usually it's, from what I recall, it's like the, the height of the, the tower and, and, you know, plus 50% or something like that. Um, if there was some type of, um, uh, you know, indication of, of how, how far uh, the CO2 uh, cloud could travel. I think Paul is looking into that, or at least had someone looking into that. Um, that might be a good um, source to help help a county guide, um, you know, a setback requirement uh, from residences and other sensitive areas. But uh, generally, yes, I would say they do have authority to um, impose setback requirements. Well, I can't tell if you want to say something there or not, so, <laughs> okay. Well, thank I, you for that. Anne, are you going to ask the next question or do you want me to? Sure. I, there were um, two people had asked, when does the 11th month timeline start and have they filed and would that filing start that 11 months? The, I'll take that. Um, the 11 month deadline, 11 month timeline starts on the day they file their application with the ICC. Uh, I, it has not been filed yet. Uh, last I heard, it was supposed to be filed in April, but then I also heard recently that it might have been pushed back. So um, I, I don't expect it any sooner than April, but there, there are ways to monitor the ICC's website to see when that kind of thing is filed. It, it's pretty easy to do. I could tell one, you know, show one of the webinar organizers how to do that. So to help people, you know, stay abreast of when it is filed. Thank you. Thank you for that, John. Uh, we have another question and I'm not sure, but I'm gonna send it to Paul. Uh, and this is from Bridget. And she says, a lot of Illinois farmland had mineral rights sold off decades ago meaning the current landowner doesn't have control over those assets. Does this also affect one's ability to permit pipelines on the land? In other words, 
does no mineral rights mean no authority to allow or deny access? Well, I'm Mike Palmasant to John since he's an Illinois attorney and I'm uh, just um, a Minnesota attorney, but my guess, and John can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, is that the pipeline isn't deep enough to affect mineral rights. So if the mineral rights are sold off, then uh, putting a pipeline wouldn't, wouldn't implicate the mineral rights. Is that more or less right, John? Well, Paul, is, Paul is right, yes. Um, and I'll note that that EMA document I referred to earlier, it calls for the pipeline to be uh, at least five feet deep. And that's nowhere near where you'd have to hit, where you need to be to hit, hit coal or any other minerals. Okay, thank you. Um, just a reminder for folks, if it appears that we're not answering your question live, it may be that we're trying to make use of our experts who are with us, but we will answer your question uh, after today, after tonight's event if we don't get, it, get to it live. We do have a question about NEPA. Um, apparently, a farm, uh, an Illinois Farm Bureau attorney recently said that the Navigator Project doesn't qualify to comply with NEPA. It says, however, this project is supposed to cover multiple states, include multiple rivers, and would obviously require either federal permits and or federal funding, which triggers NEPA. From your understanding, does this project qualify to comply with NEPA? So I can take a shot at that one. Um, probably it does qualify, but as uh, Pam said, largely with regard to the Army Corps of Engineers, water crossing permits and wetland permits. Um, and, and the Army Corps of Engineers has tried to limit the amount of environmental review. There are environmental impact statements, which is a full review, and then there are environmental assessments, which are, is a much more abbreviated review. And typically the pipeline companies try to just get away with an environmental assessment um, by having, and it's the way the Army Corps of Engineers has manipulated the environmental review process, that it can be crossing dozens and dozens of water bodies and having significant impacts, but they can get away with a very abbreviated environmental assessment. So there likely will be a NEPA review, but it, but it, it's, it's, it may be difficult to try to get them to do a full environmental impact statement, even though I think they're justified. Thank you, Paul. Anne? Um, Steve asks, are there other CO2 pipelines in Illinois? <clears throat> Um, I mean, go ahead. I, I can take a shot at that. The only other one that I'm aware of is the short pipeline that gets at the ADM Decatur facility, and it goes from their ethanol production facility to a sequestration well. And I believe the length of the pipeline is a, a kilometer long, something like that, or a mile. So I think it's a six inch pipeline. It's a very short one, and it didn't really need to go through a big permitting process because most of it was on company land. So that's really it in terms of Illinois' direct experience. And, and I guess I would point out, you know, one of the maps I showed showed that Illinois could become a super highway for a CO2 pipeline, um, you know, gathered all over the Midwest and coming down through Illinois and then connecting it down to the oil fields in Texas. So, um, you know, I, I think it's significant that um, there isn't really much experience in the state with these pipelines, but yet it could become, you know, ground zero for massive pipeline development. Thank you, Paul. We've got that's the only pipeline I'm aware of. Sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah. That's the only project I'm aware of in Illinois. We have two questions from Representative Sue uh, Shear, who's with us tonight, and, and welcome, welcome to her. I'm going to combine them into one. So she says, we know the what that a pipeline rupture can take place. Why is there not a federal or state statute that addresses the when? And at what point? Uh, at what point is a pipeline in danger, a true danger in terms of rupture, pressure, or environmental hazard? Some minimum standard must exist. And we'll combine that, I, I think it's okay to do this, with why are tax credits in existence for a pipeline that could rupture? So, uh, so she refers to the European example. So why, why are we funding this crazy scheme? Oh, who would like to take that? That sounds like a Paul to me. <laughs> and, we can, and then we can, we can, you know, everybody can have a turn. Yeah. Um, well, let's talk about um, why they're doing it. And I think it's a political reason and justification for wanting to build pipelines. 
you know, they're having, as the oil and gas industry goes into decline, although it's hard to say it will happen now with the craziness in the oil and gas markets, there's a, there's a very large pipeline construction industry that really wants work. And, you know, they go to Congress and they lobby to get things built and get government fundings, to, you know, to keep their jobs and keep their businesses going. And that's part of the reason for this. Now, there are some folks who believe that these pipelines will help stop climate change and they can use that for as a justification for building them. But there's definitely uh, arguments about whether that's in fact true. But, um, but in any case, so the pipelines have been supported in part because of, you know, industry wanting them because it's a huge amount of money that they're that they can earn and uh and then some folks who think this is gonna gonna help stop climate change so that's that and what was the question about the pipeline safety issue again safety uh, why is there not a federal or state statute that address, addresses the when and at what point of, of a rupture because we know it's you know we know what and that it can take place uh and and at what point is the pipeline a true danger in terms of rupture pressure or an environmental hazard Surely, some minimum standards must must exist. Well, that that is sort of the question, and you'd think that the standards would exist, but you have to realize that the way the federal pipeline safety laws is, is that the standards were originally set, and they haven't changed very much since nineteen for oil pipelines since nineteen eighty one, I believe, when the federal regulations for oil pipelines came out. And what those those regulations do is essentially adopt. Uh, by reference, um, industry standards. So the American Petroleum Institute actually does detailed standards for pipeline construction, design, operation, and maintenance. And then these industry standards are just adopted pretty much lock, stock, and barrel um, by the federal government. Um, and the federal regulars really don't do a lot more than sort of rubber stamp what the industry wants to do. And the question is, you know, what are the standards for CO2 pipelines and are they really adequate or not? What you know, the companies tend to be saying is they're going to, like, for example, apply the American Petroleum Institute 5L pipe uh, standard, which is the, the steel pipe uh, strength standard for for pipelines, which was developed for oil and gas pipelines. But you know, there's particular sets of models and particular engineering rules about those about that standard. But but it's not clear that it's really they've been adapted for CO2 pipelines, and that there may not simply be reliable standards for when these pipelines weaken. You know, it's not just how strong they're built initially, but they, but they also the standard has to say at what point is they corrode over time, as all pipelines do. At what point do they become so weak they become dangerous? And it's not clear that the engineering models can act, act accurately predict when a pipeline is going to become a CO2 pipeline would should be repaired or replaced or taken out of service because it's just become too um, damaged over time. You know, the standards for gas and oil pipelines are quite clear that way, and it's well understood technology. This is quite different, and it's not clear the industry in the United States has really grappled with this uh, adequately. Yeah, I would just add that, you know, a lot of it, again, as Paul indicated, was politics. Um, you know, and, and one thing that concerns me deeply is that the ICC simply does not have a lot of engineering experience with, with pipelines generally, but specifically, I, I again, I, I'll say it again, I don't think they have any experience with CO2 pipelines. Um, you know, we, in a, in a case I was involved in uh, recently, you know, we raised serious question, questions about a pipe, oil pipeline and uh, the risk of surge overpressure. And again, the, the staff personnel just did not have any experience with it, but thought it was a fine idea, let's do it anyway. So, um, and I'm not exaggerating. Paul is there, he can verify that. Um, so, you know, I just, I, I would be very concerned about what, what the ICC does with this. Um, and I will, you know, again, I'm a little jaded about, about uh, Illinois government, um, but, uh, you know, I will note that, you know, one of the commissioners now was, is he, he, his, his prior career was, um, you know, a Illinois AFL-CIO president, and I, I'm not trying to badmouth labor unions, but, um, you know, I have a hard time betting that he's going to betting against him voting no on a project that's going to, you know, result in, you know, a lot of union labor jobs. So, you know, I think it's very important that, you know, anybody who's got concerns about this, you know, raise them on the record at the ICC. Uh, so at least if something does go south, they can't claim they didn't know or weren't warned. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, I heard at a meeting last week that eminent domain didn't apply to the poor space 
the underground location where they plan to discharge the CO2. Is that correct? If so, and no one approves to provide their pore space below their land where the CO2 can be discharged, can the project be stopped? Probably an Illinois law issue. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll say this. Um, I am not aware of any Illinois statute that would allow the company to condemn pore space, you know, that far underground. So if, if they can't get a place to put a sequestered, if they can't get a place to sequester the CO2, it kind of nullifies a lot of their whole, pretty much nullifies their project. Uh, to the extent to which a county could, you know, bar, um, you know, sequestering CO2 within the county. I, I don't know the answer to that, um, but it'd be worth worth considering. Yeah, I'll just say that and maybe Pam has the statute or the bill number, but there was a bill proposed this year in the state legislature to uh, be able to condemn core space. And the fact that they were proposing that bill indicates that, that there is an existing, is not an existing law that does that. And just so people understand, usually what those bills say is that if a company can get 60 or 70 percent of the people voluntarily signed up to be uh, use their land for carbon sequestration, then the remaining balance of the people who might oppose it uh, have their are subject to have their core space condemned. And uh, it's, a, it's a pretty common kind of process in oil and gas states like Wyoming, North Dakota, Texas. Thanks, Paul. Um, we had a question. So if landowners as a whole wish to object to the project, would it be wise to contact the, the administrative law judges directly since they make the ultimate decision? Um, or what is the best area or level to contact for concerns? I'll, having been an ALJ, I'll take that. Um, do not contact the ALJ directly. Uh, that would be considered an ex parte communication. That is basically a communication that occurs outside of the record of the case. Uh, they have to report that and it cannot be used uh, to, to, in, making, in making the decision. Uh, that is the, the recommend that all communications to the judge have to be on the record at, in order to be considered. There is, I will, I will note that there is a provision in the ICC's rules and in state law that allow the public to comment on matters before the commission through the commission's website or by calling, you know, their consumers division. But again, because for, for due process reasons and under um, parties have to be able to cross examine their opponents and, and, and confront their, you know, confront witnesses against them um, the comments the public files legally cannot carry hardly any weight, if any weight at all, because there is no do no cross examination. They're not they're not sworn comments for that matter as well. Um, so, you know, legally these comments don't amount to anything, even though the law requires the ICC to take it, take them. Um, again, I think it was more of a um, feel good type bill that was passed several years ago that required the ICC to take this. Um, having said all that, you know, I don't know what goes through the mind of a commissioner when they cast their vote. So, you know, could they in their mind think, oh gosh, you know, 500 people oppose this, so I'm going to vote no. Yeah, they could do that. We would never know what they're thinking. So I don't want to discourage someone from making the comment, but I'm just saying as an attorney, legally, you know, they don't really count for anything. And that's disappointing, but that's what you've said to us as we've as we've chatted, and that's why we're going to band together and and talk about groups that can intervene. So uh, I have a question here from Jim and Terry, and I'm 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 believe I'm not sure what what the exactly is being referred to here, but I think I think our Illinois attorney probably will do the and I don't know if this section do the three hundred two. Dot 30 and 302.40 requirements apply to navigator requesting permission to survey a landowner's land. And if not, are there specific requirements preceding the request for surveying? No, the, those provisions only apply when the company is coming to negotiate a lease. They can reach out to you and ask, 
to survey your land and you can tell them no. Uh, and, and there are no rules though about their survey request. But they, I, think, I think I answered the question there, but tell me if I didn't. I think so. I hope so. I'm going to give it a go in writing. So <laughs> thank you. Okay. Um, must Navigator prove a need for the pipeline in order to receive approval? Hmm. No. Uh, I'll, no. And, and, as I indicated earlier, um, the state law that Carbon Transportation and Sequestration Act, it pretty much you know, already takes care of that for the company because it says that, um, let's see here. Uh, yeah, it says that the pipeline is a public use. It is in the public interest. It's a benefit to the welfare of Illinois. Um, it kind of sets it up as already having demonstrated the, the uh, um, you know, reasonableness of, of wanting to do, do it. Uh, the other provisions, though, in the statute would, you know, if, if they can satisfy, you know, reasonably satisfy those other provisions in the statute, they're, they're, I think they've arguably met their need burden. Um, and again, you know, speaking from experience, you know, whether something is needed uh, is up to the commission, and that's pretty subjective. Um, they will you know, in, in one case, they may look at the evidence and, and say, nope, that's not needed. And, and then look at very similar evidence in the next case and say, yep, needed. Um, so it's subjective. And, you know, if, if there is sufficient evidence against it, that's your best case for, you know, proving that the company didn't meet their burden. If, if someone doesn't put on any evidence at all, the only evidence in the case is, is, is the company saying, we want to do this. Um, I can pretty much guarantee the outcome. Thank you. Um, we had a question. Um, is there adequate evidence or research to document that the CO2 will stay in the ground forever and that it will not cause other negative interactions? You want to hear a story? I, I was involved a few years ago in, in a matter uh, in, a, in an Illinois County um, concerning NICOR gas company. And back in the 60s, they got permission to build an underground uh, natural gas storage field in uh, the area of Ancona and Garfield, Illinois. Uh, I believe those are in Livingston County, but I could be wrong. Um, they got easements from all the landowners in that area to store the gas. I believe it was about 3,000 feet below the surface. Um, and the ICC approved it and conditioned it on the gas not interfering with, you know, the water tables and the gas staying, you know, well below in that 3,000 foot down area. Within a few years, the company was back to landowners saying, hey, you know what, we would like to um, change those easements to allow us to collect gas, say about 25 feet down. Um, it turned out that the cap rock they were relying on to keep that gas 3000 feet below the surface was fractured. And in their defense, no one can be sure what, what the geology is like that far down. It just turned out they picked a bad spot and the, the domes that they were hoping to capture this gas in had cracks in them. And so the gas has just leaked to the surface. And, and what is frustrating about this experience is that this started back in the 60s. It's still leaking gas. These gas fields are still in use. Um, you know, farm fields are being, you know, productivity is harmed because when that gas comes up and displaces the other, other you know, stuff in the soil, the oxygen in the soil, it, it you know, it, it's, it, it impedes, um, you know, crop development. Um, I, I have seen videos of, of water full of, you know, water in ditches, and it's bubbling because there's that much gas coming up out of the ditch. And this has been brought up to the ICC, uh, Illinois Department of Natural Resources, I believe the Illinois EPA, and none, no one's done a damn thing. Um, if you Google WCIA um, NICOR gas field leaks, some combination like that, you'll find some recent reporting by a reporter with WCIA um, dem you know, 
video, you know, talk about the same stuff I'm talking about, documenting. Um, and, and to this day, there's gas leaking out of that gas field. And, and I say all this because no, there's no guarantee that the, the CO2 is going to stay that far down. Um, they can't guarantee that. I'm not aware of any of anyone that can guarantee that they will, you know, never have this the subsurface gas, whether it's natural gas or or CO2 never come to the surface. I don't know, Paul, if you have any thoughts on that. I, yeah, I would just add that the way the, the, the CO2 sequestration wells are either printed by the EPA or by a state of its delegated authority to the states under the Class 6 well program. And the Class 6 well program uh, states that once they stop pumping sequestered CO2 into it and they seal it up, then they have to monitor it for a relatively short time. And when the company uh, finishes using this, this the sequestration well, they um, they basically transfer the, the well and the liability for any leak leakage from that well and that field to the state. So Illinois will take on the liability if that uh, sequestration site fails. So it's and again another way that the federal law just really makes it easy for companies to take the money and then literally run. Just, Jessica, do you want to add to that, or, or I, we haven't really heard from you? And okay, because I know this is a question that you you would probably have answered as well. Okay, so I, I'm I'm looking at the time, and I'm thinking there's there's a few questions that might be of, of interest, but uh, but we do want to wrap up, and uh, I think I think Joyce's uh, comment might be uh, one that 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 would be Joyce Herent that we could ask and, and then look at the other ones in, in writing. And that would include Governor Pritzker taking a position on this. Uh, and I just wanna say, we will answer all these questions. So the question Joyce asked, which might be good to do with our experts here. Uh, she says, I am interested in knowing what a public safety review includes. Is there any jurisdiction that has this defined or is it in the law somewhere? What defines public safety? I don't know who wants to take that. Well, I can tell you under the Public Utilities Act that the ICC is, you know, operates under. I, there's no definition of public safety, um, you know, in, in this part of the statute. So it, it is what the commission deems it to be on that occasion. And as part of that question about the pipeline safety or the generally safety, what do you think? Generally, generally, how do you define public safety? Where do we go to, to figure that out? If we're going to be talking about the pipeline and, and how, you know, whether or not it meets that test. Where is well, that? as I said, um, you know, with the pipeline, Federal Pipeline Safety Act, everybody says, oh, it means that it, if it preempts absolutely everything related to safety, and that's just simply not true. There are multiple things that local governments can do that could be fall to the, the category of, like, you know, of safety that are not, in, you know, in fact, printed by federal law. The Federal Pipeline Safety Act applies to operators of pipelines with regard to their the design, construction, operation, and maintenance of a pipeline. And, and so, if, for example, a local government could say you can't build a hospital near an existing pipeline. Why? Because such rule would not tell the pipeline operator what to do about the design, construction, operation, or maintenance of its pipeline. It would tell a third party what they can and cannot do in terms of infringing on an existing easement. It's a really obvious example of it's a safety issue, but it's simply not regulated by the federal government. In fact, FEMSA encourages counties to take that kind of action. And then, you know, with regard to, again, first responders and police departments, the federal government doesn't march in and tell them how to respond to these pipelines. You know, it says that the pipeline company, again, regulating the pipeline company has to have a safety plan. And one can look at, for example, the safety plan for the Source Valley pipeline, a CO2 pipeline up in North Dakota, and it only says what the pipeline employees will do. And it only provides equipment for the pipeline employees, not for first responders or for citizens. You know, so again, the, the law there, sure, emergency response is related to safety, but what a, what a city or town or state can't do is tell the company how to prepare its plan. That's the federal plan, but they can prepare their own plans. And then federal law says that the company's required to coordinate with such local planning. So the Pipeline Safety Act actually anticipates that, you know, that the 
that the pipeline companies will need to work with the uh, local authorities to work together to plan to coordinate their separate planning processes. So, you know, again, pipeline safety is not uh, doesn't cover every absolutely everything. There's different things that state, cities and states and counties can do, and and uh, county commissioners and city officials should be circumspect about that because there's a lot of industry propaganda out there that they can't do anything. A lot of industry propaganda. It's simply not true. Thank you, John. I, I think we should wrap up our our questions here and and conclude this this webinar. So. Um, let me go to my ending remarks because I do have, okay. So um, I do want to thank everybody, uh, everybody for being here uh, for sure. And I did drop the link into the chat uh, multiple times and just know that, that we'll get that out to you again. Uh, but we all, we want to thank our presenters and thank all of you for being uh, with us tonight. And we did want to leave you with a few thoughts. So if you haven't picked up on this already, we are hoping that everybody will engage in this fight. Everybody, not just the coalition, not just a few on this call, but everybody. Everybody needs to do this and we need to do it together. So that's, that's something that I think is, has been a theme of this evening's meeting. And I think what Jessica said as she began her presentation is rather inspirational. She received the letter. She said, oh, <laughs> this isn't good. I better, I better go contact my neighbors. And she went door to door and began to organize, right? So uh, first it was one, then it was two, then it was five, then it was 20. Then she's holding a meeting. Now she's doing webinars, by the way. So she's really into this. Uh, not, that might not be for you, but everybody can do something, right? Do what's best for you. Maybe it's not organizing, but maybe you can call your local officials when you get to that point. Ask them to protect you through zoning and special use permits. Maybe it's showing up to county board meetings and making your voice heard. Maybe it's writing letters to the editor and we'll give you the tools to do that as we move forward. But whatever it is, we want you to engage and do something because it's gonna take all of us to stop this pipeline. And finally, don't sign that volunteer easement. I mean, what was it John said? Seriously, do not sign an easement agreement. There'll be time for you to sign when you can decide later on that's, that's what's right for you, but we're not there yet. And you'll hope you'll join us and all of the folks who are in uh, Iowa, Nebraska, South Dakota, and Minnesota who are really working hard to stop this pipeline. Uh, so we're not alone here in Illinois. There's been a lot of work that's been going on before we even noticed it, at least I'll speak for me. So, uh, and, and we're, in, we're hearing there's going to be a myriad of, of pipelines crisscrossing the Midwest. So we need everybody, all of us here in Illinois, all of us in the adjacent states, and together we might have a chance at stopping this. So, and finally, um, on I, Lan, I can just show my slide if that's easier for the screen. There's, uh, this is how, this is how to, to find us. Um, let's see, let me go to the next slide. We want to make sure that you stay in touch with us, right? So we have a website and we're updating that all the time. We have an email, not too hard to find, uh, to remember coalition and it's at the URL of our website, noillinoisco2pipelines.org. And we have a phone number and we actually answer the phone. <laughs> so if you call uh, and you get you get a voicemail, know that you'll get a return call. So we care about staying in touch with you and we hope you'll stay connected with us. And I'll leave this up on the screen for a little bit. And with that, I want to bid you all a good night. And again, thank you for being with us. And we look forward to connecting with you in the future.